our centering words for today. Breathe in and invite the spirit of wisdom to fill your soul. Breathe out, recalling the spirit of love that connects you with all God's children, past, present, and future. So this is the echo. <laughs> Then if you'd either in body or spirit rise to the call to worship. Jesus calls us to servant ministry. We must be willing to help others, not counting the cost or rewards. Pretense, disharmony, greed have no place in discipleship. Serving God means receiving each person as though they were a beloved child. Lord, Help us to truly become your disciples. Create in us hearts for ministries of compassion and kindness. Then our opening prayer, Lord, be, be with, with us this day, day helping, helping us to put our priorities in order so that, that we may faithfully serve you by serving your people. Heal our spirits, enable us to follow your ways all the days of our lives. Amen. And then our opening hymn is Happy the Home When God is There is number 445. We have a special collection that we'll be taking up today and next Sunday. It's a free will offering in addition to what you would put into the offering plate. If you would like to make a donation to the Historic Paradise Church Cemetery Association, there is a lovely mason jar so marked back there on the table. We'll be collecting today and also next Sunday. A gift of support, if possible, is much appreciated. But the righteousness of God sets aside bias and jealousy as we welcome the opportunity to go wherever God leads to take the good news to others. So we want to ask for God's blessing over the offerings today. Let us first prepare for that by singing together the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him
God of love and mercy, we bring our offerings with grateful hearts, honoring your enduring guidance in our lives. Just as wisdom from above works with willing hands and provides for those in need, may these gifts given today be used to nurture and uplift our community. Inspire us to follow your teachings of kindness and generosity. Transform the contributions into acts of love and justice, spreading your light in the world. May we always give credit to your divine wisdom and grace. It's in your holy name that we pray and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. See, no others. There are things that we hold in confidence for other people because we don't feel we have authority to share them, whether it's for ourselves or someone else. And so we go to God in silent prayer first, and then we will all pray together. Heavenly Father, how well you know and understand those special prayers that are needed. We always understand, although sometimes we forget, we understand that you do know what is uh, happening in the world and what's going on in our lives, and you care. How amazed we can be at the solutions Jesus offers to disciples when they question their importance to him, or his kingdom. We're going to hear today how the disciples want to know if they will receive great rewards, if they will be recognized and praised for their accomplishments, or at least for their efforts. I think I say it a lot, but times change and people don't. We're still so much like those early disciples. We want you to know how hard we work. We want to be praised and recognized for our efforts and successes. And we want you to pass over our failures as though they were inconsequential. When Jesus was confronted with their fears and concerns, he responded that they should be ready for service rather than adulation. After all, adulation takes care of itself. And then he placed a small child in their midst, a child with no guile and no pretense. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. He was talking to them about how it is that he is coming to them. So help us to reach out, not, or reach out to others rather, not with thought of importance or gain, but in love and compassion, truly caring for each one we meet. When we have done this, we will have truly given our hearts and our service to our Lord. You are the one who calls us to prayer. Let us share the words that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now that we have reconciled ourselves to God, let us reconcile with one another by rising and passing the peace of Christ in any way that you wish. And that means you can stay seated too if you want. As we make our way back to our seats, we're going to prepare our hearts to hear the word and the word proclaimed by remaining seated. And we're going to turn to number 125 and sing together the hymn of preparation, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah.
I'm going to go in that. He'll know. I might go to the next line. I might go to the next stanza, next page. But thank you for being steadfast and keeping on, keeping on. I want to go into our first reading uh, first by sort of setting this up. I'm, I'm framing kind of where we're going to go with this little bit of a history lesson that we have today. And I'm going to begin in the letter from James, where he's urging early Christians to seek divine wisdom, wisdom they don't already have. Not the wisdom that came just into their own mind or wisdom that they might have been told all their life, but the wisdom that comes from above. So this is James 3, verses 13 to chapter 4, verse 3, and then uh, 7 and a part of verse 8. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And the final reading comes from the book of Mark. And in this reading, Jesus is teaching the disciples yet again about his coming, suffering, and death and resurrection, teaching them about his identity. But he's kind of, um, it's kind of like a teacher school. He's teaching them how to teach. He's teaching them how to approach the students that they will have, those disciples they're going to go out and disciple. But this is like first year for them. Pay really close attention to how the disciples approach Jesus when it comes to having questions when they don't understand something. So this is Mark 9, verses 30 to 37. From there they went out and began to go through Galilee. And Jesus did not want anyone to know about it, for he was teaching his disciples and telling them, the Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. But they did not understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask him. They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, Jesus began to question them. What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way they had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he shall have to be last of all and servant of all. Taking a child, he set him before them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. And whoever receives me does not receive me but him who sent me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This was really hard to put together and not have you here for an afternoon's long message. So praise be to editing. But I do want to share with you about the scripture challenging us to ponder what it takes to follow Christ, what it takes to be a disciple who goes out and makes disciples. We don't become a Christian simply because we just say we're a Christian. We don't become a Christian because we are in agreement with every tick and tittle of Christian documentation or our foundational um, documents. It's not being able to recite the Apostles' Creed without skipping a beat and not flinching when we are saying what we believe. Really, following Jesus requires us 
to speak a little bit of Jesus' language. Because Jesus spoke the language of the disciples, right? I know this is a silly question, but I'm going somewhere with this. The disciples struggled to understand what Jesus was saying, not because they didn't speak his language, but because they had to get to the deeper meaning in the heart of it because it was so different from what they were taught, what society and culture was used to. Now, we are very blessed because we have Bibles that have been translated from the original language into our own and into the first language of people all over the world. There are so many of them available, but there was a time when that simply was not the case. But Jesus is also helping them to understand how do we go about sharing this good news with other people? Well, how is he going about it with them? He talks about little ones, how to welcome little ones. Well, how many of you welcome little ones recently? Think about how you go about welcoming little ones, right? When um, my niece, when our niece came and she brought her little firecracker baby, born on the 4th of July, um, and her almost two-year-old, well, how do you approach them? Do you talk to them like you do, you know, some annoying person? No. Do you talk to them like you do to any grown-up? Of course not. Your choice of words change. How you go about saying them changes. Sometimes your tone and your inflection changes because you want them to see you as not being threatening. And I will often sit on the floor because although extremely close to the ground, they are still shorter than me, so I can get down there and be at their eye level. What does Jesus do before he teaches? He sits down. And that's how he teaches. Everybody sits down. They're all on the same level, at eye level. So we're trying to make them comfortable, get them to know that we genuinely care about them so that they don't feel scared, they feel free to ask a question, they don't feel unworthy or in the way. This was a big deal because children were the lowest rung of the ladder in that society. I'd like to think we value our children, we value the babies. They didn't then. If you remember when children tried to get to Jesus, the disciples, out of, well, hey, this has been trained into them for their whole life. They're like, no, get away from me, kid, you bother me. And Jesus said, no, let them come to me. Jesus uplifted the children that society had been long oppressing. Now today we are honoring a part of the valley's past. That is a picture of the second uh, Paradise Church that is located on Parad was located because it's gone now, but it was on uh, Paradise Road in Coburn. The second one, uh, there, was, there were two built, the, both of them overseen by the same person. But the reason that we're talking about this today is because there were three denominations that came together because they were essentially believing the same things. And so they united together to become United Methodist. And they could not have been doing what they were doing had there not been this great reformation that started a couple hundred years before. You know how time marches on very slowly? Those reformations began in the 1500s. They were building this church in the 1800s. But they were coming here in the 1700s and bringing all of these things that they have, um, the, all these changes that had taken place. Because starting in those 1500s, there were people like my 12 times great grandfather, John Knox, who were taking on the church and reforming the church in order to live as the Bible teaches. But see, the problem was they had no clue what was in scripture because the Bible was not shared in their language, unless you spoke Latin as your first language. Now, I studied the Reformation over the summer. One of the things I learned, which I thought was really interesting, was some of the people that were saying the Latin didn't know what they were saying. And at that time, it was obedience to the church above everything else. Okay, so all those years, all those deaths, because humans had distorted church law to benefit the church, and oppress the people. Just to have the Bible translated into the language people understood was this huge thing. It was a huge thing. And if you're interested in studying the Reformation, you'll find they took place all over the place at roughly the same time, sort of starting at the same time. Germany, Scotland, England, Switzerland, and it's fascinating. Other places too, but it's fascinating to see how hard powerful people worked 
to prevent the common man, woman, or child from getting that book called the Bible. What was so dangerous in that book? Truth and light. 100% proof that what others were saying was in there was not in there. In fact, in England, if you go back, you can find it in history records. When they did get the first Bibles in English, they had to chain them to the pulpit so they would not go missing. So here we have many people coming to escape tyrannical churches in addition to tyrannical kings. Times change, but people and human nature really doesn't because we've spent a lot of time in the last few weeks talking about the temple in Jerusalem and how Jesus goes in there and says outright, it's become infested with hypocrites. Jesus informs those hypocrites that they're epi the epitome of what the prophet Isaiah shares from uh, 2913, the book of Isaiah. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. And in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. They were creating rules, throwing out the commandments of God with the full expectation people will obey the church over God's command. Three such sets of folks known as Methodist Episcopal, United Brethren, and Evangelical Association came here to the valley and their circuit riders went out preaching. They had amazing camp revivals. And one of those Evangelical Association fellows named Sebastian Musser, who lived in Coburn area, was a landowner, farmer, and a lay preacher. He gave the land that this building would be constructed on so that the Paradise class could meet there because they'd long outgrown being able to gather in a home. There were just too many families. And he oversaw the building of both of those churches, the first one and the second, which is probably why they refer to it as Mosser's or Musser's Church. All this to help frame what took place there in 1839. The seventh General Conference of the Evangelical Association was held at Paradise Church. They'd been kind of a loosely organized entity prior to that, as most new entities are. So they buttoned up their Articles of Faith. Articles of Faith are the very foundation of what this is built upon. And you can see what our Articles of Religion are today online if you go to the United Methodist Church website and you can, you can read it there. But they buttoned them up. They referred to them as Articles of Faith rather than Articles of Religion. And I want to share with you a passage from an article titled Putting Down Roots, Part 3, from our United Methodist publication, The Chronicle, that was printed in 2019. Quote, as Pennsylvania's frontier gave way to settled communities and circuit riders in each of our predecessor denominations began to minister on a regular basis, what we now think of as traditional congregations began to develop. Paradise Church was one of the earliest church buildings completed in 1831. The 1839 General Conference of the Evangelical Association held at Paradise Church was arguably the most significant to date in the history of the young denomination. The actions taken at that general conference effectively changed the loosely connected followers of Jacob Albright into an organized denomination with well-defined structure and built-in accountability. Hitherto, the discipline included no statements defining or limiting the power of the general conference so that it had, in effect, unlimited power to alter the doctrines and government of the denomination. This body adopted a constitution defining the power of future general conferences and stating that the articles of faith could not be altered by any future assembly." End quote. Conferences, oops, oops, reading now, rather, from the United Methodist Church website, and it's under foundational documents you can find about the Articles of Faith. And I quote, the Articles of Religion were edited and adapted by John Wesley from the Articles of Religion of the Church of England, which were originally established in 1563. So this is the 1700s when they're doing this. John and Charles Wesley were priests in the Church of England, 
and many of the First Methodists were members of it. The Methodist Episcopal Church slightly adapted them in the early years of the denomination before 1808 for use in the United States of America. So we've got the Methodist Episcopals taking those articles out of that church. You know, the Church of England came out of the Roman Catholic Church because King Henry VIII wanted a divorce so he could marry Anne Boleyn. But if you go back and study that, it's a fascinating story. And the original Roman Catholic Church, of course, others would take them from there. But th what they did was fascinating. All these different groups would take these articles. They would start with those articles that had all these man-made things in there, how you could pay your way out of purgatory, all of these things. And they sat down with the Bible, one they could understand, and started to whittle away anything and everything that was not backed up by scripture. All three of the denominations that merged to become our United Methodist Church, when they sat down with those articles that they brought, were strikingly similar, which makes sense. If you tune 10 pianos to the same tuning fork, don't they sound the same? For all the change that happens over generations, those articles of religion, as they are known in our denomination, remain the same and always will. The word of God is always on the move, however, so there's an ironic twist to the Paradise Church story. Prior to, and I'm talking just days before the 1839 General Conference, Bishop Seibert, and I will refer to Bishop Seibert because he was elected there as the first elected bishop after Albright, never used the word bishop. He didn't want it. Because of, if you go back and you study the Reformation, bishops had a really bad reputation. It's like, you might as well say playboy or some other horrible thing or, you know, convicted felon. I mean, it was a bad, he never went by bishop. But we know and understand what is meant by that. He was overseeing the denomination. So in that sense, Bishop Seibert came out early and he was going about, he was very big on missional service. He was really big on sending missionaries out in order to take the word of God to different places. And so he spoke about that. And he also then spoke at the general conference about the advantages of moving west to Illinois to aid in the westward spreading of the gospel and challenged by Seibert most of the congregation, 48 souls, packed up and went to Stephenson County, Illinois. And you can read about that if you want to. It's, it, they do have some information online about the impact that they had there. But the years that followed here found the remnants of Sebastian Musser's church traveling to other nearby churches. There were so few of them left. There were lots of churches popping up. So everybody had one that was close to them. A lot of the items from that second church that you see in that picture there have found their way to the Penns Valley Historical Museum. And you know, the Dutch Fall Festival is the first weekend of October, and you can go there. If you go into the barn specifically, they do have the offering plate, which kind of looks to me like a butterfly catcher, you know, because it's got like the bag on it. But no, it's not for butterflies, it's for the offering. They have a lot of things that are stored there, but if you ask to see them, I'm sure they would help you to see them. Due to the dwindling um, number of people, the church actually closed in 1960 and a storm proved too much for the structure and it was demolished in 1963. But some of the materials were retained and they were retained for a purpose because the members wanted the Methodist church to make this an official part of our shared history and make it a landmark, a historic landmark. And so what they did was the congregation that remained kept money and resources for a monument that would be constructed remembering the first United Evangelical Church in Center County. And it was dedicated in uh, 1974, May 19th to be exact, 50 years ago. And the Reverend Clyde Way, who is the gentleman you can kind of see is pretty small in that picture. Uh, but he was the superintendent of State College District, and he organized the event that day. Bishop Herman Kadnick, who was the bishop at the time, was the main speaker. The chairman of the Commission on Archives and History, Reverend Howard Smith, read scripture and offered prayer. Special music was provided by the Spiritones Quartet from Belfont. I don't know if anybody remembers the Spiritones. 
and a picnic was held later at Coburn Park. A lot has changed since 1974. A lot of the headstones had been damaged, knocked down or fallen over. Uh, some, the little infant headstones they believed were missing. Um, fortunately, that wasn't the case, but there were a lot of people that came together uh, and made some decisions after two, in 2019, St. James Church in Coburn found out they owned it. <laughs> uh, when Milheim Church closed, they sold it, they deeded it to St. James for a dollar, but everybody who knew about it apparently forgot about it and they really didn't know. So upon finding that out, they first understood why they were financially supporting the mowing, but now they understood that they really wanted to ensure the ongoing perpetual care for that location and keep it local. Because really, you know, you know it's taken care of better locally. So they organized in the summer of 2021 the Historic Paradise Church Cemetery Association and volunteers went to work. They got lessons in how to properly clean and maintain headstones. They know more about cleaning headstones than they ever thought they would ever need to know. But they did make it a labor of love and they went there and they've had several work days and it has been multi-generational as you can see. All to, to bring back to life this cemetery as it once was. Now as I said, they really believed that infants row as they referred to it because there were um, smallpox and other uh, diseases that went through the area and really hit hard. They had believed them to be gone. Well, they weren't gone. What had happened was over time they fell and the cemetery on a hill has an issue. And that issue is rain will come down and eventually it's gonna cover that up. So they were just a couple inches under the ground, revealed and, and brought up and cleaned up and then set aright again. There is always a need for people to volunteer, always a need to sit on that cemetery association and our next meeting is going to be the first Tuesday of March. And I bet you don't have anything on your calendar yet. I bet you don't even have a calendar yet for 2025. But if you can keep that in mind, it'll be in the bulletins closer too. But that first Tuesday in March will be the next meeting of the Cemetery Association at St. James at 7 o'clock. We are delighted to say that it is good to see families, those connected to the church and connected to the cemetery, taking such an interest in it. Are there any people here who have helped with the cleaning or maintenance of the cemetery? Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Um, we do have families connected with people at the church. Anybody here connected with the families there? Yeah, there you go, Miss Virginia. She'll tell you all you need to know. <laughs> and we also are very excited that the monument is it's, it's kind of a little shaky. It's, it needs a lot of help. And we've been fundraising for the last few years. And the work has been scheduled to make it beautiful and strong and sturdy again for the next several generations to come and visit and see it in its splendor. The work will be completed by Thanksgiving or Christmas weather dependent. And we do hope next year to be able to have a special service there. Uh, so watch your bulletins for information about that. But just think about how great the need is, how few the workers are, but what a story. Do you know what other things happened? So much happened at that conference. Georgine Sirfoss wrote a book. This little booklet is $12 and it's available at the historical, uh, Penns Valley Historical Museum. We do have several at St. James right now. If you'd like me to bring you one, uh, please let me know. But it's Jacob, Sebastian, and John, the history of the Ev Evangelical Association in Penns Valley. And she's got all of the information in here. But at that conference, they ordered 6,000 more Bibles to be printed because each of those three entities had their own publishing house. They also upped the number of their publications that went out. I can't remember if it was twice monthly, but it's in this book. And it was the most widely read, it was in German, widely read publication in the United States at that time. And they needed to make more. At that conference, they also established that Orwig, do you remember that name? would put together Sunday school materials. Anybody ever hear that word or that name with Sunday school materials? Well, you weren't there in 1839, so probably not. But it was amazing how they were absolutely getting the word of God out to people. 6,000 Bibles in their own language, just incredible. 
So I want to close the message with a special prayer that's going to really focus on this church and the memory of the things that happened there and those who are faithfully attending both now and in the future. So let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, we've gathered in your presence with hearts full of gratitude, remembering the faithful who came before us and paved the way for the witness of your gospel. We honor the lives and legacies of those who've gathered at Paradise Grounds at the seventh general conference of the Evangelical Association, whose hearts were stirred by your spirit and whose hands worked diligently to build up your church and take the word of God wherever they could. We thank you for giving them that vision. We thank you for their courage and their devotion to your call. May their faithful service inspire us to continue the work of your growing of the kingdom. We lift up to the, you, those who are handling the care with diligence and love as they honor the memory of those who've gone before. And as they nurture the land and preserve the sacred spaces, May they be reminded of the enduring connection between past and present and future. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please rise in body or in spirit as we sing together our closing hymn, number 77, How Great Thou Art.
Go now in confidence and peace, joyfully serving the Lord who walks with you, just as he walked with all of those who've come before us, just as he will walk with all those who are to come. Bring hope to the hopeless, joy to those who sorrow, and peace to the afflicted. Remember who you are in Christ and be true witnesses to the love of God. Go now and know that God goes with you. Amen. Thank you.